cannabis was my drug of choice yeah. because I knew it wouldn't kill me. You know, and you know, yeah. when, when you're making that decision, things are not okay. I started yeah. very young, very okay. prepubescent. Yeah. All the way up to the age of 30. Wow. May yeah. I ask uh, what yeah. finally prompted you to try to get into recovery? I'm, I'm always curious because to me, yeah. it's always a miracle. It's always a miracle. It is a, so. it is a fucking yeah. miracle indeed, mm -hmm. which, which hopefully we can talk about. I'm curious kind of how you, obviously you explained it in the book, but just generally how people, how that miracle happens, so to speak. I think from about, I got sort of convicted for trafficking when I was a teen. Lots of, con the consequences were building up. I think, I don't seem to be getting emotional right now about it, but when I asked, I always do. I, from a little kid, whenever they asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a dad. And yeah, it was so, and so I think I managed to, as they say, rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic in my life mm -hmm. where I had, I had money and I was working kind of to your point earlier, it doesn't matter where you are in life. And then I got married because I thought that might fix me, so to speak, mm -hmm. I convinced myself and my wife mm -hmm. who I'm still married mm -hmm. to today, it was a good idea. And then that was sort of, and I was lying to her and all kinds of that house of cards was kind of crumbling and right. the lies and the deceit. I just, that my conscience in my head, just finally, I was able mm -hmm. to listen to it because mm -hmm. from about 15 years old, it was like, this is bad. You should stop. This is bad. You should right. stop. So, so yeah, I asked a, a friend who I used to rave with and he was an addiction counselor at a treatment center. Mm -hmm. And I thought if that guy could get better, then I have a chance. Right. Uh, so there, yeah. And then I just remember he gave me a big hug. He said, it doesn't have to be like this anymore. Oh. Yeah, it was beautiful. And that was sort yeah. of, a, I guess that was about t almost 12 years ago. Wow. And so still married, <laughs> lots of Al-Anon yeah. and AA and yeah. therapy and the whole nine. And are, um, are you a dad? I am. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah, two. Of two. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. So I did. I reached my dream and the other dream is having conversations like this. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. All the good things school. that come yeah. with recovery. Yeah. 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 And so as you were describing the balance, I guess it just becomes more and more clear neuroscientifically to me, just how many gremlins were in my brain yeah. in my, right. and I just, Right. Like you said, it was just about feeling normal and okay. It wasn't even about feeling right. happy. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just, just getting oh. caught in it, just getting caught in it. And then yeah. it's so hard to get out. Then even when you, you do finally see it, it's, it's not easy. You know, you have to abstain for long enough for those gremlins yeah. to get the memo. Okay. We're not doing this cannabis thing anymore. I guess I can get off the seesaw, but you know, they do it yeah. reluctantly. So, yeah. but I'm, yeah. thank you for sharing that. I, I think yeah. it's just so powerful and it's, yeah, it's Indeed. amazing. I mean, it's an amazing life accomplishment. It is. It's sort of that idea though. I remember my sponsor saying only addicts want to pat on the back for things normal people do. <laughs> so it's like the balance of like, yes, it's an accomplishment <laughs> and you know, but, but I love it. You know, that's the, the humility, right. That comes yeah. with something like having to face off something like that in your life. Yeah. Uh, it's that kind of humility is, is a great thing for sure. And maybe that's a nice segue into the another question here. I want to ask you in terms of actually maybe two, I'll start with the, yeah. cause I don't think we, or at least I, the dopamine system of addiction, you kind of described it, but I think a lot of people always assume it's that hit of dopamine, that hit of dopamine mm -hmm. that you get from the substance or behavior. But I think as I understood from your book, at some point it actually becomes the pursuit of the substance or mm -hmm. the behavior that's mm -hmm. more, I don't know if it's rewarding or what, can you kind of describe those two things? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the pursuit of the substance and to some extent for some people, the hiding can really be part of the reinforcing aspect mm -hmm. of it. That kind of whole double life thing, that rebel, yeah, yeah. you know, that I have this thing that nobody else knows about that nobody else can control. It's also for many people, especially in my experience, a lot of people who develop severe addictions have avoidant coping strategies. So they have a very difficult time expressing their anger, going to the person saying, I'm upset about this. So instead they kind of go along, you know, get along to go along or go along to get along. And, um, and then they take care of themselves by themselves doing, doing their drug. So, you know, that becomes sort of the self care method. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's complicated and, and all tied up and I forgot what your question was. Yeah, no, that's okay. Cause it was that you're describing the, 
the oh yeah the way that the reward. right yes thank you versus thank the you. reward versus the yes. pursuit yeah. So that's a, a couple things. So, you know, initially when we use reinforcing substances and behaviors, we get that hit of dopamine, our balance tilts to the, the pleasure side. But over time, repeated effects really just lands us chronically tilted to the pain side. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden we're not using because it's pleasurable. We're using so that it's, we, you know, it stops being painful. And the craving is then what is driving it, even absent any pleasure. So a lot of people with severe addiction will, be, will tell you, I hate this substance. Yeah, yes, I yes, hate yes. this behavior. I don't want to do it anymore. And yet I cannot stop. So that's part of it. The other thing that's interesting, I think, is the fact that reminders of using, like people, places, and things are related to our use, also release dopamine, followed by mm -hmm. a little mini dopamine deficit state that then triggers the cravings. So you can get into this craving loop even when you're not using, but just because you saw somebody that you used to use with or went by the place where you used to use or smelled, you know, what smelled like your drug of choice or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not, you know, it might start out for some people as being about the pursuit of pleasure, but eventually it just becomes the pursuit of trying to not be in pain. Right. Wow. And the dopamine release in the pursuit is to just sort of make the pain go away. Is that the reward in some sense? Is well, what, kind of... essentially once you've entered that dopamine deficit state and those gremlins yeah. have accumulated on the pain side of your balance, yeah. remember the drive is always to homeostasis. Right. So the craving is nature's response to get you back to homeostasis. So you're, you're craving to use because it's not like really rational. It's, it's more reflexive. You just, you want to bring those dopamine levels back up to baseline or better yet above baseline, right? Cause right, now, right, cause right, you're right. now you're below baseline. 